Good morning. Welcome to Smithville Brethren Church this morning. And for those of you that are joining online, no need to change your screen. This is not Art. Art is actually away this morning. He is watching Caitlin uh, run in a state cross-country meet, so I'll be filling in today. Wanted to draw your attention to a couple items in the bulletin. The first of those is, we invite you out for the annual business meeting. Whether or not you are a member of the church, you are more than welcome to be there to uh, hear news and uh, to participate in finding out what's going on in our church. That will be November 14th at 6 p.m. As well, it is Operation Christmas Child season, and we are looking forward to uh, folks participating in filling boxes. And I know Rex has a little bit more information this morning for all of us. Uh, last Sunday, I said there was one lonely packed shoe box out there. Well, praise God, there's a bunch more with it. It's no longer lonely. There's a bunch more out there. Thank you. But there's a whole table full of empty shoe boxes out there yet. So even if you've packed one, grab another one. Grab a couple more. Uh, there's plenty more out there, and, many, and there's plenty more where those came from as well. Third, if, you would, if you're so inclined, we do need help, especially in that drop-off week. And there's a sign-up sheet out there. So I'd appreciate you signing up for a specific time. I know a couple of you said, well, you know, I, I could make it... Uh, but your name hasn't appeared on that sheet yet, and I'd really like to have it in black and white that you're going to be there. So, uh, thank you. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we want to thank you for the opportunity to worship you this morning. Let us not see ourselves as um, the audience, but rather as the participants, as the choir, as those who are here to pray passionately. We seek your face this morning. We wish to find you. And we know that is a prayer that you are going to answer. So now, receive our worship, speak to your people, fill us with your Holy Spirit, prepare us for your use. In the name of Jesus, amen. Please take your copy of God's Word. You want to turn to the book of 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We are going to be reading from verses 5 through 11 out of the New International Version. And if you need a pew Bible, you can turn to page 1796. 
2 Corinthians chapter 2, and as you're turning there, just a little bit of background on the passage. We are aware of um, two books of Corinthians that are in our Bible. We also know that there was a third letter that the Apostle Paul wrote in between the books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians. We have never found that letter, and the early church did not seem to be bothered uh, in not knowing that. I simply share that to say as you read through uh, the book, occasionally it, it's sort of like listening to um, your spouse speak on the telephone. You can clearly hear one side of the conversation. You can't always hear everything uh, about the other side of the conversation, but you begin to sort of pick up a little bit of background and sort of piece together some things. This passage seems to be referring to a um, situation of sin that is addressed in the book of 1 Corinthians, but it is um, sort of um, not as detailed as to be able to say exactly that is what is going on, but that is what we think. So, we're going to read 2 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5. If anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you to some extent, not to put it too severely. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient. Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. Another reason I wrote you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. Anyone you forgive, I also forgive, and what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. Please join me for a word of prayer. Father, this morning, we recognize that we need to be forgivers as you are for a, a forgiver. Sometimes that is very difficult. The wounds are deep. The pain is raw. We wonder where justice is. We question, do other people believe things that are said? Do other people think that the behavior that we experienced was all right? And yet we are called to be like Jesus Christ, who even from the cross asked you to forgive those who had nailed him there. We ask, Father, that you would give us your strength to be able to forgive those who have injured us. Let us be instruments of peace. Let us be people that bridge uh, between individuals. We ask, Father, that we might share the life-giving message of Jesus Christ so that others might find peace with you. We pray for our culture. We pray for our country. It seems as if there is conflict between people in a way that we have never seen in our lifetime. And we ask, Father, that you would use your people to share your message and to be like Jesus Christ. Let us also be like Christ in being givers through Operation Christmas Child. To be givers of our time, of our prayers, of our worship to you. Let us find ourselves, our lives, in surrendering them to the use of the Master. And it's in the name of our Master, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
Unless you live in New York City, you probably haven't heard of Good Riddance Day. Good Riddance Day is a Latin American-inspired tradition in which New Year's revelers stuff dolls with objects representing bad memories and then set the dolls on fire. Organizers of Good Riddance Day encourage people to make a list of their grievances, then toss the lists into shredders, symbolizing the act of letting go of painful memories, bad experiences, foolish mistakes, bad relationships, dumb choices, and long-held grudges that have been festering inside participants. And just in case a shredder does not provide enough emotional release, organizers will provide you with a sledgehammer. Good Riddance Day is celebrated in Times Square on New New Year's Day between noon and 1 p.m. Now, I'm guessing you probably didn't make it. And if you didn't, you have three choices. You can either wait until New Year's Day to make a pilgrimage to New York City, You can keep an emotional knapsack full of your pain, or you can celebrate Good Riddance Day today at Smithville Brethren Church. Now, if you haven't yet made your choice, and I sincerely hope your plan isn't to hang on to some items you need to throw out, let's prepare by looking at a few verses from the New Testament penned by a Jewish rabbi who converted to Christianity. And if you have your Bibles, again, we want to take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. This time I'm going to read it out of the New Living Translation, just to give you a little bit of a different uh, flavor for this, but you should be able to follow along. The Apostle Paul writes, I am not overstating it when I say that the man who caused all the trouble hurt all of you more than he hurt me. Most of you opposed him, and that was punishment enough. Now, however, it is time to forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, he may be overcome by discouragement. So I urge you now to reaffirm your love for him. I wrote to you as I did to test you and to see if you would fully comply with my instructions. When you forgive this man, I forgive him too. And when I forgive whatever needs to be forgiven, I do so with Christ's authority for your benefit so that Satan will not outsmart us, for we are familiar with his evil schemes. So why is it so necessary that we forgive those who repent? Well, the Bible highlights for us five different reasons that we should forgive those who have repented. First, we should forgive people because forgiveness displays God's mercy. Psalm 103 says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. Even though God has the most to forgive, he chooses to forgive. God is much more likely to forgive than we are, and if we only forgive people as often as, excuse me, if God only forgives us as often as we forgive others, then all of us would be hopeless, helpless, and hapless. You're probably familiar with To err is human, and what? To forgive is divine. We are called to be holy, and we are holy like God is holy, not just when we insist on his standards, but when we forgive those who don't measure up to them. Remember in Isaiah chapter 6, How Isaiah sees the Lord high and lifted up with seraphim proclaiming, Holy, holy, holy. In that moment, Isaiah immediately recognizes that his mouth has uttered things that were completely contrary to this holiness of God that he stands before. God's standards were beyond Isaiah's ability to measure up. But the passage goes on to record how in response to Isaiah missing God's standard 
for his speech and his communication, God provided a way for Isaiah to be forgiven and to be made ready to serve this holy God. So God's holiness not just requires us to live up to a a certain standard. God's holiness allows for us to miss that standard and yet experience God's forgiveness. So we are called to be holy, and we are holy like God is holy, not just when we insist on those around us living up to those high standards, but in how we respond to those who have not met those standards, and we offer to those folks forgiveness. The second reason why forgiveness is necessary is because forgiveness restores the sinner. Secretly, I would like to think that I have more in common with the older brother than the prodigal son. After all, haven't I played by the rules? I never asked for the inheritance early, didn't squander my father's money in the far country, never hired prostitutes or attended wild parties, and never ended up in a pig pen jonesing for the pig food. No, dad was never waiting by the window for me. That's what I would like to think. But the reality is all of us have been both the prodigal son as well as the older brother. All of us have wandered far from the Father. All of us have squandered what he has given us. All of us have spent time in the far country, in wild living, and in the pig pen. We may all have taken separate roads, and some have traveled farther on the road than others, or perhaps stayed longer. But all of us have to trudge the exact same road back to our Father. Forgiveness is the road that restores the sinner to the Father. I like how one pastor put it in a sermon. He reminded his audience how when they see someone being punished for their sin, they were to remember that all of us are great sinners too. His advice was to speak to ourselves this way. I am that man. In a thousand ways, I am that man. I have murdered in my heart a host of men and women. I have stolen their names and reputations in the things that I have thought and said about them. And what I have done against men and women, I have done still more and still worse against God. And if I never actually committed murder or theft, well, I know my heart well enough to know that that has more to do with the circumstances of my life than it has to do with any virtue in me. With a different upbringing, with a different set of temptations, what would I have done and what would I not have done? Wendy and I used to live, or excuse me, Wendy and I live in Worcester on Inverness Drive. Now, we'll give you our address if you would like to have a pizza delivered anytime to us. We're open to that. But I want you to imagine for a moment that Inverness Drive is closed. Wendy and I would be delighted there would be no cars speeding past our home. But we would also be disappointed that your pizza would never arrive as well. Forgiveness is a two-way street. Either we open the road for another sinner to come back, or we close the road for both of us. The road is either open or closed. If open, then we forgive other sinners. If closed, then we ourselves are forever unforgiven. Either everyone gets the pizza, or no one gets the pizza. Jesus said this for us in Matthew chapter 6 verse 14. At the end of the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says the following, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive 
your sins. In our passage, Paul tells the Corinthian congregation in verse 7, Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Think for a moment about excessive sorrow. I wonder, have you ever said, I can forgive, but I can't forget? Well, perhaps it would be helpful to note that when the Bible talks about God remembering our sins no more, that that term is actually an accounting term. What it means is God no longer places under our name that we owe him this particular debt. He chooses to cross out the debt. It's not that he cannot call to mind what you have done. It is that he chooses to no longer hold it against you. And in the same way, I think sometimes we look and we want to say, I can't forget. But that's not the point of forgiveness. It's not to all of a sudden have moral Alzheimer's. It doesn't mean that you all of a sudden cannot recall what has happened. It's that you choose to no longer hold it against someone. Proverbs 10, 12 says, Hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers over all wrongs. To cover means that they are no longer held against someone else. When love covers a wrong, it means that they are not mentioned in conversations with or about the person. Imagine if the, uh, of, imagine if the Ohio Highway Patrol sent you a notice every month reminding you of all the speeding tickets you had ever been issued. Maybe they would say something like, hey, you used to owe us money. Yes, you paid it, but we just wanted to remind you that it used to be outstanding. You would probably be upset. I know I would be. But our behavior is little different when we mention what someone once did, once said, once was guilty of, and we often do it for years or even decades after the event, the conversation, the experience is over. Here's the principle. If the debt is paid, we need to stop sending notices. Third reason why forgiveness is necessary is forgiveness demonstrates our obedience. Returning to our passage, take a look at verse 9. It says, The reason I wrote you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. The person was supposed to be obedient, wasn't in our passage. The Corinthians were supposed to be obedient and forgive, but perhaps hadn't. Obedience is required of the sinner as well as the forgiver. If Christ has forgiven me for my many sins, how can I not forgive my erring brother or sister? We lose our right to be angry if we sin in response to someone else's sin. After all, unforgiveness is just another form of unrepentance. Whatever it is the person has done to you, whether that is your spouse or your parents or a co-worker or a neighbor or your whatever it is, whatever it is that they have done, and we will assume for a moment it was wrong. That is their lack of obedience. But when Christ steps up to you and says, you need to forgive them, if you don't, that is your sin. And how is it that we feel morally superior when we say, oh, well, they sinned, so now I don't have to forgive them and I can sin? It's not a hall pass. It doesn't work that way with God. You expected them to be obedient. God expects you to be obedient. And so when we forgive, we practice obedience in this area with Christ. 
How we forgive or not reveals how obedient we are or not. Fourth, forgiveness reflects the character of Christ. Five times in verse 10, Paul uses words forgive or forgiven. Notice verse 10. If you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake. The secret of forgiveness is the four consecutive letters in the middle of the word forgiveness. They are G I V E. Forgiveness is a gift, and so is the spirit of forgiveness. God gives us the spirit, and then we give the gift. We often find it hard to forgive because we don't ask God for the gift of his spirit. Forgiveness has nothing to do with someone deserving it. Just as a gift is freely given and never deserved, forgiveness is extended freely and never deserved. Forgiveness is unnecessary if it can be merited. There are times the pain, however, is so deep, the damage so profound, your memory so scarred, your pain is, or excuse me, your reputation so tarnished, your emotions so raw, your body so battered, it can never be made right. Never. If someone asks you why you haven't forgiven someone yet, at the core, it probably has something to do with someone needing to earn it in your mind. We expect an apology, perhaps a sign of contrition, a bit more suffering. But all of these are ways we expect people to pay a little bit more for our forgiveness. Allow me to say this. Trust can be earned, and trust should be earned. But forgiveness can't be earned. Forgiveness and trust are two very different categories of restoration. Just because we forgive does not mean that we trust a person. Forgiveness is instantaneous, while trust is progressive. Our problem is often that we make trust instantaneous, and forgiveness progressive. So, for instance, if I were to loan a car to one of my boys, and my boy went out and drove very recklessly and wrecked the car. If he wrecked the car, I might think twice about handing him the keys to Wendy's car the next day. That has nothing to do with forgiveness. That is an issue of trust. Forgiveness is the issue of how many times I verbally lash him for having the accident. Is it one hour's worth and then he's paid the debt? Will it be two hours of listening to dad jaw about it? And if it's a really bad day, maybe it ought to be three hours, right? That's how we operate. But forgiveness is choosing not to verbally lash. I can do that instantaneously. But the issue of trusting him with the keys to the car may take a few weeks or several months, perhaps even years, depending on what the issue would be. Those are separate issues of restoration. But please remember, we are called to be like Christ, who is a giver of his forgiveness. Finally, forgiveness thwarts Satan's strategies. Take a look at verses 10 and 11. It says, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake in order that Satan might not outwit us. For we are not unaware of his schemes. Paul ends his appeal by reminding his readers of the high price of unforgiveness. We forgive in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. 
Now that word schemes in your Bible, that's worth underlining or highlighting or circling or putting a note into the margins. That word is one that refers to military strategy. Satan has a strategy that he likes to employ in the lives of those who do not forgive. It has the idea of an enemy force of commandos that under cover of darkness slips behind our lines and sets up a base camp far in the rear. Because we were sleeping, we never saw it coming, and that's exactly what has happened to many Christians. Our unforgiveness has allowed Satan to set up a base camp in our hearts. We don't even know what is going on, but Satan, the ultimate spiritual terrorist, attacks us when we least expect it. Have you ever experienced the following? You get angry without an apparent cause. You are too quick to be critical of other folks. You avoid talking to certain people. You nurse a victim mentality, or you slander others who have hurt you. Perhaps you rip into innocent people. You say unkind things and then try to laugh it off. Perhaps you refuse to consider meeting with certain people, or you think about those people day and night. Or perhaps you've been consumed by bitterness. In those situations, we sense there is something wrong, but often we cannot put our finger on it. And what it often is, is a lack of forgiveness with somebody in our lives. Back when Wendy and I lived in Springfield, we realized there was a mouse loose at the parsonage. We found calling cards left in our kitchen drawers. We had other mice prior peanut butter and a couple of traps, and they were soon history. But we never saw this mouse coming, not once. Somehow he made his way into the house and was doing damage slowly, almost imperceptibly. Well, as Satan set up a base camp of bitterness in you, Paul points out unforgiveness is a battle strategy of our accuser. If he can't get you to sin, he will try to get you to sin in response to somebody else's sin. Perhaps you were aware of some bitterness, some anger, some unresolved issues that you need to deal with. Whatever the Spirit has pointed out, fix it totally, and I encourage you to fix it today. I would also add that it may be something that you have to deal with repeatedly. It is very easy to cross somebody's name off the ledger and then a couple days later think, no, I think I'll write them right back up there. I would encourage you, one of the best things you can do is to pray for somebody you have issues with. I'll tell you a personal story just for what it's worth. When I was in my early teen years, I attended a um, youth group in the local area, and um, as a part of that youth group, there was one gal, I just, she irritated the ever-living crap out of me. I'm just going to tell you that. Um, just one of those folks that I don't know what it was that was so incredibly irritating, but it was, uh, she had that magic, whatever it was, in spades. And I remember listening and hearing what you need to do with somebody you're struggling with is to pray for them. So I can remember each day I would wake up and I, you know, I would sort of start out with, God, I don't want to pray for this person, but you know what? I guess just, just bless them somehow. I don't even know. Just, I guess just bless them. And I struggled. And I prayed for months and months and months. And what I discovered was God began to melt my attitude towards that person. The stuff that was really irritating to me, it was not that this gal was doing anything differently. It was that my heart was being changed by Christ. Fast forward a couple years, what was amazing to me was I actually dated that gal. Um, I'm not suggesting you should be praying for folks you're hoping to date someday. Please don't do that. But, um, but the point is, God can change 
your heart. Whether they change the other person's heart is a different issue. But God can change your heart. And how freeing would it be for you to be able to walk into a room and not worry who's there? How great would it be for you to sleep well at night? How great would it be for you to no longer feel the barbs of the things that have been said about you? It does not mean that person will not be addressed by God. It means they will not be addressed by you. Forgiveness is freeing for the forgiver. Forgiveness is God's medicine for a broken heart. Forgiveness heals the deepest wounds. Forgiveness repairs what the devil has destroyed. Forgiveness opens the door to even greater blessings by God. Let me pray for you. Father, this morning it would be remiss to leave anyone here thinking that forgiveness is easy. It is one of the most difficult places of obedience we are ever asked to do. And we struggle. And yet, Father, you call us to be like you. To forgive from the heart. To allow you to deal with what has been said, what has been done, and who has done it. Father, you have forgiven us so much. Help us to forgive those that in comparison have hurt us so little. Let us do it so that we can be holy like you. Let us do it so that we can be obedient. Let us do it so that we can be like Christ. Let us do it so we can have your blessing. In the name of Jesus, amen. Father, we thank you that we have experienced forgiveness from you. Now, Father, let us pass the gift on to others. For those struggling, pour out your spirit. For those that need to have conversations, open a way. For those that need to forgive those who are no longer here, let them seek that forgiveness in prayer with you. And thank you that Jesus has blazed the trail in showing how to forgive others. Let us be like him. In the name of Christ, amen.